Okay. Uh, right. So let me continue with this uh, examples. Uh, there's a new example. Uh, there were several questions about uh, confinement and so on. Yeah, I guess this is not uh, we. Um, it's, uh, there's a very nice um, uh, place to read about this. Uh, Nagaosa has uh, two books on many body uh, problem. And I think he discussed this, uh, at least the Polyakov argument uh, is given there. So I think that's a good place to start uh, to read about, about it. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> yeah, so a, a second example is um, these transition metal di dichalcogenides, uh, this tandem disulfide. Uh, this is a famous material that has been studied uh, for 50 years. Uh, and, um, right. And these materials are layer systems. Uh, the, the tantalum are surrounded by a cage, uh, usually three triangles above and three triangles below. And uh, this one T is uh, signified the polytype where the two triangles are rotated. Uh, um, so, uh, the other one is a prismatic, where they sit on top of each other. Okay, so it's, it's kind of like ABC stacking. Um, uh, the three layers, but as far as we're concerned, we can just focus on on these guys, which, if you look from the top, form a triangular lattice. Okay, so that's that's good. So we have a triangular lattice as a starting point, and this um, uh, the TMD system very often have charge density wave distortion, and this particular one has a famous one called the uh, Star of David uh, uh, distortion below 180 Kelvin. Uh, where uh, this this uh, star David motif, uh, the atoms move in towards the middle, uh, and I would call this a cluster, a star David uh, cluster. Now, importantly, there are thirteen sites in the star David. If you count the one in the middle, okay, uh, twelve parameter. So it's very important. It's thirteen because thirteen is odd. Okay, so so this actually is going to. Uh, Play the role of a mod insulator because uh, if you do the electron count, there's actually uh, 13 electron per unit cell. So we can imagine that 12 of them are paired up, uh, and then one of them is left. So this should be uh, um, a mod insulator. And indeed, uh, this system is the only two-dimensional charge wave system that has an insulating ground state. So the resistivity uh, goes up. Everything else resistivity goes down. The reason is that if you have net, uh, charge sense wave due to nesting, uh, in 2D, unlike one dimension, you can usually not kill the entire Fermi surface. So you always have a piece of Fermi surface left. <clears throat> and in fact, the low temperature is a better metal than with the high temperature because uh, you have less scattering. Um, so this is a really exceptional, the, uh, this tandem disulfide uh, family. And it was already understood by uh, Tosati and Fasikers uh, that uh, um, due to the band folding, because we have the 13 uh, site unit cell, right? So the Bruan song is one thirteenth of the original size. So you have, you have to fold <coughs> 13 bands inside the unit cell. <coughs> and, and then you actually end up with a narrow band. So today I don't need to explain this to you, right? Because it's, uh, uh, this is actually the granddaddy of the uh, twisted bilayer uh, graphene system, right? Uh, of course, there the unit cell is even bigger. The Morel unit cell is even bigger. It has hundreds of atoms, but here we only have 13. Okay. Now, the thing is that um, if it's a mod, so I would call this uh, class of material cluster mod insulator stage. Um, and, and, and by the way, you can see with your eyes these uh, distortion by, nowadays with STM, right? You can, this is the, this is the 13 site unit cell that, uh, that you can see. Right, so you, you don't, uh, well, that's amazing of uh, technology from from uh, 50 years of development, right? Um, however, you know, if you have mod insulator, we should expect local moment from these uh, sites. And as I said, uh, typically you would see some um, uh, Curie-wise uh, behavior, and then uh, it may be at some low temperature, some phase transition to an insulator. But there's no sign of local moment. There's no Curie-wise uh, behavior that, that is seen. Uh, by the way, th so these guys are really uh, insulated because you can do tunneling and you can see the spectrum. There's a gap, zero is here. Uh, this is what people call the upper Hubbard band and this is what people call the lower Hubbard band. 
Um, so uh, this is the mod gap. This is, will be the charge gap that I was uh, telling you about. Uh, this is, uh, of course, integrated overall momentum. Uh, but you can see that the bandwidth is uh, 100 millivolts is fairly large. Uh, and the gap is about 100 millivolts. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, several years ago, Vic Law and I uh, proposed that uh, this is actually a good candidate for a uh, quantum spin liquid. I, I, we call this a 45 euro quantum spin liquid uh, because there's no sign of magnetism and, and mu s r find no magnetic ordering down to 70 milli Kelvin. Okay. However, uh, there's an escape route because it turns out that uh, even though these things form layers, uh, the style of David distortion uh, actually forms bilayer and they could stack on top of each other or sometimes they may be single layer occasionally, but uh, um, most of the time they stack on top of each other. But when you have stacking on top of each other, then um, uh, then this form a bilayer system and now you have an even number of electrons uh, per unit cell, right? And then you can have just a simple uh, singlet formation um, uh, of, of dimers. So that becomes a trivial uh, singlet ground state and, and no longer spin liquid. Okay. So uh, now, so um, now, interestingly, the same uh, Matsuda group uh, reported uh, again linear uh, thermal conductivity as a function of t square, like this. Okay. Um, and if this is really the case, uh, this again is a really a shooting, uh, smoking gun for, for uh, spin on Fermi surface, right? Because this is conducting heat like a metal, okay? Again, there's controversy. Uh, this has not been seen by other groups, but in this case, uh, they actually can reproduce it and further can show, they show that by adding disorder, by messing up the sample, they can make this uh, thing go away. They can make this linear uh, extrapolation go away. So that strengthened the case, but again, this, this still uh, um, needs to be uh, discussed. So my hypothesis is that perhaps uh, these stackings are not perfect. So once in a while, there are some single layers that, uh, that are really spin liquid. So most of them are gapped, but there's some single layers that spin liquid and maybe those can uh, carry heat like a metal. Okay, but that's a speculation at the moment. Okay. Um, Right. So the, now the question is, can you, are there other experimental evidence if you want to look for this state? Well, Ross and Sento has a proposal that uh, you can do quasi-particle interference. Uh, if you have impurities, if they're spin-ons, they would scatter from these uh, uh, quasi-particles quasi and form some kind of uh, uh, interference pattern. Uh, it's well known in, in the electron Fermi surface, that, but they say that the same thing should happen. <clears throat> near the threshold of the upper and lower upper band. So the proposal is that if you go here and look around here uh, in the function of space <clears throat> near impurity, you may see some quasi-particle interference pattern. I have to say that this has been searched for, but so far has not been found. Okay, so what I want to um, uh, tell you, show you is um, uh, some uh, recent work uh, by uh, of my Chromis group on a related material, which is tandem diselenide, okay, not sulfide. Uh, but the advantage here is that they can do a single monolayer. Uh, I think they actually grow this by MBE, but these can also be, uh, be uh, scotch taped. Uh, so, uh, so this is a promising way to go because, uh, because this uh, avoids the uh, bilayer doubling uh, problem that, that, uh, that we have. And, uh, the, the STM spectra are actually very similar to the tandem disulfide. Um, so this system is interesting because it, <clears throat> it's actually metallic in the bulk, but it's known that the top layer is uh, insulating from uh, um, uh, RPS and uh, from the photo uh, from the tunneling spectrum. Uh, STM, uh, they, they see that it's uh, insulating. So I've been collaborating with them uh, and I, I want to just tell you briefly about something very interesting that they have seen. And uh, by the way, this is the this is the mod gap. So zero is here. So this is what they call the upper half band. This is the lower half band. Okay. Uh, so that, with SDM, they can they can they can look at these uh, patterns. So in, in this case, uh, they each dot is actually one on one cluster. Okay. Um, now the interesting thing they saw the interesting thing they saw is that 
there's something called a uh, supermodulation that they see, namely that there's actually an incommensurate structure that appears on top of this star of David. So the star of David uh, cluster themselves distort and forms a uh, periodic modulation. It's difficult to see this from real space, but when they do a Fourier transform, they can see that their momentum space uh, peak. These are extra uh, Bragg peaks that showed up. So this is already the reduced Brillouin zone. So this is a Brillouin zone corresponding to the one sixth, one thirteenth site unit cell. And within this uh, unit cell, there's some incommensurate uh, uh, peak that showed up that uh, lights up only at low energy associated with this mod uh, Hubble band. Okay. So this is very interesting because uh, an incommensurate density wave is very unusual in an insulator. Now we see this in metal uh, due to power's uh, you know, charge density wave formation, or maybe nesting. But in an insulator, um, I, I don't uh, know any examples where you really see incommensurate structures. Um, in spin system, you can have incommensurate thing due to uh, 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 anti-symmetric exchange and, and, and that. But um, yeah, so what's the origin of this? Um, so it turns out that, uh, so we made a proposal that what they're seeing is some kind of a composite order. Uh, namely, there's some fundamental order that they're not seeing, which could be a spin density wave or a pair density wave that has a certain momentum Q. And this Q would uh, have to do with a fermion, Fermi surface. Okay, so let me backtrack a little bit. So the picture is that we have this uh, reduced uh, Brillouin zone. And we know that the Fermi surface, uh, if there's a spin on, the Fermi surface should be half filled. And so, and it's quite isotropic uh, and um, nearest neighbor hopping. So we know the Fermi surface very well. It should look very much like a circle, okay? And this is the next uh, unit cell. So 2KF is usually, the, the if there's a scattering vector, special vector is a, is a spanning vector of the Fermi surface, right? So usually you might expect some kind of nesting behavior. So may, you may expect some kind of uh, instability at 2KF for, for this kind of Fermi surface, if it were a uh, Fermi surface. Now, in uh, in fact, the 2KF uh, is just the vector co connecting between these two circle because you can uh, subtract off the uh, the Umklopp term, okay? So this P1 is actually the same vector as the 2KF uh, in around this direction, okay? Right. So it turns out that if you make uh, take this P1 and, and put it here and make a vector sum of the of the two P1, then you get this part, spot. And this part is exactly uh, where they see this distortion. Okay. So this picture um, is able to account not just for the existence of this uh, distortion, but also the exact position of this uh, of the of the distortion. That they see, and again, the the line of reasoning is that they're not directly seeing a um, a instability, which would have been here, right? So, if they were directly seeing that uh, distortion, they would have seen black spots here, but they don't see black spot here. Okay, so the idea is that they're actually seeing what is called a composite uh, order parameter. So, in Landau theory, you can take one of these order parameter, and multiply it by another one, right? Because these have, uh, uh, this is a so-called triple Q because they're in equivalent uh, wave vector redirections. And then Landau's theory allows you to couple this to a charge order parameter with the sum of the two Qs, okay? So you can see that this uh, obeys all the requirements of uh, Landau's theory being real and uh, uh, conserve momentum and so on, okay? And so we think that this is what they're seeing, uh, but this may be a spin density wave. Of course, uh, in uh, STM, they are not they cannot see spin density wave. So the hope is maybe if you have a spin polarized uh, STM tip, maybe you may start seeing this. So I would say that uh, uh, this is some maybe some evidence for that even though KF is not directly observed, um, there's some hope that this actually may be an indication that there's some KF. Uh, momentum lurking behind there. Okay. Um, so let me just conclude this uh, part one of this talk by just saying that I think what is missing up to now, you know, apart from these uh, 
uh, discussion is that uh, is there a way of directly seeing this gauge field? You know, we, we keep emphasizing the importance of these gauge fields. Um, it would be nice to be able to to see that uh, directly. How do you measure it? Well, I think one uh, idea is that uh, remember I said that external magnetic field would generate an internal gauge field. Okay, so the, if if there's a Fermi surface, this Fermi surface will see this internal gauge field. And then there should be quantum oscillations in the magnetization. Okay, so that was first predicted by uh, Motrinich. Um, and of course, if you see quantum oscillations in an insulator, uh, with uh, uh, then then that that would be a really, uh, uh, I think, very conclusive evidence that uh, something like this may may be happening. Uh, we also predicted that there should be thermal Hall effect by the same reasoning that the external magnetic field can produce an internal gauge field, which can deflect the spin nons that are carrying heat. And that is not seen experimentally so far. Um, and another prediction we made is that uh, because of these uh, spin on, which are gapless excitation, uh, they actually can produce uh, uh, optical excitation, electromagnetic absorption. You might say that, oh, okay, the spin ons are uh, charge neutral. How do they couple to the light? But as I was trying to explain to you, the external electric field can produce an internal gauge field, which can excite these uh, spin ons. So we can think of the spin ons as actually like dipole. So we predicted that there are uh, uh, absorption that goes like omega square or some power begin at omega square inside the mod gap. And uh, they can be looked for optically. And there's some evidence for, for that uh, uh, by, uh, by Dressel's group by fine infrared and uh, going down to terror uh, uh, absorption. And also um, uh, new, new Gaddix group have seen some, some evidence for that in the uh, Herbert Smithite. Uh, this is something uh, that's kind of uh, strange and amusing that I, let me just point out. It's, uh, it's, it's well known, it's not that well known, but it's, it should be well known that uh, in conventional superconductor, if you measure ultrasound, a transverse ultrasound attenuation, Right at the transition point, there's a rapid drop in a, in a clean material. This picture uh, is actually in uh, Shiva's book. Uh, and the reason is that it has to do with Meister effect. So transverse ultratron actually couples the transverse electromagnetic field. And once the Meister effect comes in, it suppresses the uh, transverse magnetic field, okay, because of the Meister effect. And that suddenly reduces the uh, ultrasound absorption. Okay, so if you can see something like this, uh, if the spin on, if the six degree uh, transition is actually has to do with spin on pairing, as some of us uh, suspect, uh, then you might expect to see some kind of sudden drop in the in the transverse ultrasound, and this will be an evidence for a gauge Meissner effect. So this will be the Meissner effect of the gauge field, uh, which will be quite exotic again. Okay, all right. So the conclusion of this part is that. Uh, I think quantum spin liquid is uh, after 50 years, uh, uh, it's coming of age. Um, and there are new examples and there's plenty to do experimentally. And I think there's a lot of uh, theoretical issues to be sorted out. And I think also trying to propose uh, new experiments uh, to do. I think, unfortunately, I think, I don't think there's definitive proof of a spin on Fermi surface. I think there's a, um, a lot of uh, smoke, <laughs> a lot of suggestions, but um, I think nothing that uh, everybody has agreed on yet. Okay. All right. So now I can go on to the second uh, part of my talk. How am I doing for time? That's good. Okay. So how do I do this? Escape. Okay. So this actually has two parts. Um, first, I want to discuss a, a continuous metal insulator transition. Um, in a bandwidth control system. So I already alluded to that a little bit, namely that uh, um, uh, uh, you, you, especially if there's a spin on Fermi surface, then you can imagine a continuous uh, transition from an insulator to a metal by the spin on becoming a electron Fermi surface. Okay. And uh, this is not my theory. So I want to review, uh, I think the best theory up to now is done by Sento. So I reviewed that a little bit. But uh, more, more, I want to talk about some very recent experiment that somebody actually have uh, already mentioned uh, and, and discussed that. Uh, that's interesting. 
Uh, in the second part, I hope to spend a little bit uh, of uh, my remaining time to talk about some very recent work. Uh, some of it is just uh, on archive and some of it is not even published. On the pump, on a very interesting class of experiments, uh, pump, pump probe experimental studies of systems that are near the mod transition. Okay, so for the last decade, um, especially uh, people around uh, Cavallari's group uh, have reported experiments that see superconducting like response uh, in this pump probe experiment, which is uh, very amazing. And uh, I, well, I hope that uh, we might be able to throw some light on that. Um, and, and, and you'll see that uh, we, all the tools I talked about, we uh, basically use uh, to, to try to uh, discuss this. Yeah. Okay, so this, uh, yeah. Okay, so first let me uh, talk about this uh, transition. So again, this we have seen before. We want to uh, look at the bandwidth control uh, um, system. And we have this uh, Ginsburg-Landau term with my negative sign. And the working idea is the gauge field, uh, fermionic gauge field coupled to gauge field, uh, fermionic, fermions coupled to gauge field, and bosons coupled to the same gauge field, but, but with a particle and whole part uh, spectrum. Okay. Okay, so as we said before, this naturally could describe a kind of a continuous transition with some critical point in T over U where a spin on Fermi surface uh, transition into a Fermi surface with both condensation and here the mod cap closes continuously and then uh, become a Fermi surface. Okay. So a rather complete description was given by Santo uh, already back in uh, 2008. And he shows that the critical point is described by um, um, 2D XY model. So, so this, is, this statement is actually quite natural because, um, uh, so remember we have fermion system coupled to gauge field and we have the uh, bosonic system uh, coupled to gauge field. So this is actually uh, just an XY model. Uh, uh, if you just take the phase uh, coupled to gauge field. So it has a same universality class as a 3D XY model. What Santu uh, showed is that uh, quite surprisingly, uh, the bosons actually more or less decouple from the fermion plus gauge field uh, problem. And so the problem, uh, uh, this, you know, this problem looked extremely complicated, uh, but actually he could uh, make a quite interesting statement uh, with some confidence uh, on this uh, problem. And uh, the result uh, is shown here. It turns out that the transition is a little bit more complicated than the standard uh, quantum critical point transition. So this is a T. Uh, diagram. So instead of one crossover, uh, there are two crossover uh, terms, and um, and um, right. So for example, this one here is one where you on this side you have a mod insulator with spin on Fermi surface. The specific heat goes like t to the two third. On this side, you have Landau Fermi liquid. Uh, specific heat goes like t. The critical region is actually only slightly in, somewhere in between. And specific heat is predicted to be going like T log T. Okay, so that's kind of this. But because of some details of the way the spin on the bosons are affecting the gauge field, there it turns out that there are two crossover lines. And that has to do with this uh, next observation, which is a, a very interesting prediction. And that he predicted that there's a universal jump in the resistivity at the transition. So here's a metal. And here's the insulator. So in the metal, at low temperature, in the limit of zero temperature, you expect a finite uh, resistance due to impurity scattering. Uh, in the mod insulator, at zero temperature, resistivity would be infinite. Okay. Uh, so how do you go from finite to infinite? Well, you may think that oh, just we would just go from from finite to infinite, right? But then to say no, there's an intermediate step where uh, at criticality, there's a uh, jump in the resistance. And this jump is a universal uh, number uh, given by this uh, famous uh, um, quantized resist resistance H over E square. <clears throat> H, over e, H, H, over, H over E square. With some number that is not known, but the reason for that is actually a 
fairly straightforward consequence of this Yofei Larkin rule that I talked about. The resistivity is the sum of the fermion resistivity and the boson resistivity. The fermion resistivity is simple, which is a constant, and then goes to infinity, right? At the uh, if, if if the system is uh, is insulating. But the boson resistivity is that for a three-dimensional XY model uh, or two plus one dimensional XY model. And it's known that that transition has a, uh, at the critical point, there's a universal uh, conductance at that critical point. So that system, uh, and that system, it would go from a um, superconductor, right? Uh, the XY model has a superconductor to insulate the transition. So the resistivity will be zero here and it goes to infinity on this side. But in that case, there is a jump. Uh, there's an intermediate point um, that has been uh, studied. So you just put two, to, two plus two together. Now we just instructed to add the boson conductivity and the resistivity and the fermion resistivity. So we just add one thing that like this and the other like this. So now you can get this uh, picture, right? So it's, it's relatively straightforward, but uh, quite surprising uh, prediction uh, for this effect. Okay, so now to the experiments. So in 2018, uh, three years ago, uh, Canola's group uh, uh, studied this a spin liquid material that we talked about. It's the same one that uh, the ET salt that I talked about that has this funny transition at six degrees. Um, and these materials become uh, uh, under pressure uh, becomes uh, metal, and it's a very small amount of pressure. It's mega per cal, mega pascal, less than one gigapascal. Okay, um, and it becomes a uh, a uh, metal, but in fact, it becomes a superconductor uh, if you blow this up. So this is a blown up of the scale. Uh, it becomes a um, three degree three Kelvin superconductor. Okay, that's uh, already very interesting, right? Because that was part of our hope, and that if you uh, that the superconductor maybe live very close to the, if you can introduce mobile carrier into a spin liquid, it may become a superconductor, okay? And uh, so there was this funny transition at six Kelvin. If that were a kind of a spin on pairing state, then this will make a beautiful story. Uh, uh, but of course, we don't, we don't know that. It's a speculation at this point. Okay, but what is seen here, what he's showing is that uh, if you look at this line, this is a continuous uh, line. So by straightening this out, he can make a uh, um, study this uh, con continuous phase transition. <clears throat> okay, I should hurry up slightly. <clears throat> so these are the detailed uh, resistivity curve. <clears throat> Temperature, this is log scale resistance. And, you know, you see the metal, 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 some funny thing going on. It's insulating, insulating, insulating. Uh, and then there's a... Um, place where the resistors bunch up. And maybe this is uh, Santos' uh, uh, critical resistance. We don't know. <clears throat> and the resistivity uh, goes like T square yeah, throughout this metallic state. Okay. And so that's uh, what is known on that. Now, I want to mention two examples that was already alluded to earlier. And that has to do with this Moray system that is very much involved now. <clears throat> so there are two groups that have made this kind of material. The first is a twisted bilayer tungsten diselenide. Um, so this actually has a similar structure as the tannin diselenide. It's the same, basically the same structure, uh, except you replace tungsten by uh, tannin by tungsten. Uh, and another one is a, bi a bilayer putting moly diterite on top of tungsten diselenide. And because of the lattice mismatch, uh, you can get a uh, moray pattern. So this is a story uh, for the um, for the twisted case. Uh, you have a, I think, fairly uh, 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 yeah. You have a twist angle, and then you get this moray pattern <coughs> that contains maybe uh, twenty or thirty uh, sites. <coughs> Not as large as uh, graphene, but but there. And uh, so the nice thing about this is that just like graphene, twisted graphene, they can put a bottom gate and a top gate. So they can tune <clears throat> both the charging per unit cell and <clears throat> also a, a uh, kind of an electric field or displacement field between the top and bottom, okay? So what they find is that they can, by 
are filling with both the top and bottom gate within in the two that parameter space they can keep the system at half filling at one stay at one uh, per moray one carrier per moray uh, unit cell and yet has another parameter to tune them through a metal into transition right so this is for a variety of displacement field uh metal metal down here and then some uh, the metal somehow suddenly have a uh, um, uh, going up, going up. So I, mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe you want to call this an insulator that is somehow saturating. But uh, this clearly is a insulator to metal transition and it looks very continuous. Okay. Now, one thing that's very interesting is that the resistivity is quadratic. So this is blow up of these few points, actually. The resistivity is quadratic. Uh, and then at the critical, what looks like a critical point becomes linear. So there's a linear resistivity right there. And maybe this is a jump uh, the center was looking for because uh, the, uh, so, so these are very closely spaced uh, change in D and the resistivity suddenly jump before it uh, takes off. Now it doesn't quite make it into an insulator, but maybe some kind of a saturation, I don't know. But anyway, that's the interpretation. So again, in this scale, the critical jump would be here. This point is actually this point. Okay. Now the other system is uh, Alo Cornell, uh, uh, Kinfai Marx group. <coughs> and um, uh, uh, again, uh, without twisting, but with the different lattice uh, mismatch, they get more ray patterns. And they uh, again have the uh, metal insulator. Right? And here they mark this uh, uh, H over E square right here. So again, there is some kind of uh, a thing. Now, the, the difference here is that the if they plot the conductivity versus T square, it's always linear. It's always quadratic. So they never found this linear conductivity uh, with the other group, the other group this. And now is a question of what do you interpret as the jump? Is there a jump in this uh, universal jump? Uh, if there is one, this is huge. This is 10 to the six, and this is, you know, 10 to the four, right? So there's two orders of magnitude different. So I just say that there's that the systems are different in details. Um, the linear resistivity is seen of the, we have three systems up to now. The linear resistivity is seen only in this case. Um, there, if there's a jump in, uh, in the conductance, it's, it's not universal, it's changed by a lot. Um, now the indicate in, the, in so now we don't know, right? Yeah. Uh, in this system, if there's been non Fermi service on the insulating side, right? But the good thing is that uh, there's no uh, magnetic phase transition. Um, they know that, uh, particularly in in this uh, in this system. Amazingly, even with one layer, they are able to measure the spin susceptibility optically, and that's because of uh, I think they were using some uh, chirality of the optical. Uh, 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 because of the uh, uh, the optics uh, between the saddle uh, between the uh, valley, um, so they show that there's no uh, kinks, no phase transition uh, down to a few degrees. And uh, so, uh, from what we discussed before, I, I think these are actually very good candidates for for spin on uh, Fermi surface. And then the question is that is there a way to to test it to learn? You have one layer. And you cannot do STM tunneling because you need to top gate. So you're a little bit constrained, but uh, I think it's uh, up to your imagination to uh, to think why, uh, how to probe it. So but I think these are very promising system because uh, of course it's nice to have a knob you can just turn and drive something through a uh, a transition, a quantum uh, critical point. Right. So here is a nice plot of the. Uh, this is the energy gap that they get from the. Uh, from fitting the resistivity. And on this side is the is the coefficient of the term, which means like a mass. So the mass is diverging and the gap is open. Okay. So I kind of leave this, uh, uh, but I just, uh, the purpose of this is just to show you that these systems exist and uh, potentially I think very interesting. I hope a lot more work uh, would be done on these. So in the last uh, 25 minutes, I want to talk about some very recent work that uh, I've been doing with my former student, uh, Zhe Hao uh, Dai.
uh, who is currently a Moore Fellow at, uh, at Berkeley. And, um, so the general theme is that now we want to apply external drive uh, uh, to the system. And particularly, we're particularly interested in the system near mod transition to see what an external drive would do uh, in that case. <clears throat> so this were motivated <clears throat> by experiments over the last decade that shows um, superconducting-like response at temperature much higher than the superconducting TC. <clears throat> and so far, the experiments have been done in three different systems. The first is a high TC cuprase in the pseudo gap phase under the cuprase LSCO uh, YBCO. Um, now, and the second is the organic uh, superconductor. So this is a variant of the spin liquid that we talked about. We just replace this uh, this uh, uh, cation by something else. And this is a 12 degree superconductor. This is the highest uh, TC organic superconductor that is known. <clears throat> and this is a uh, quite recent work. And <clears throat> finally, there's a buckyball superconductor, potassium free C60. This is a 20 degree uh, superconductor. And um, was uh, first done five years ago, and there's a more recent paper, uh, so you can look them up. Okay, so the general theme is that you pump the system with far infrared uh, with an intense uh, 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 optical pump and probe, and then you measure the real and imaginary part of the uh, frequency dependent conductivity at lower frequency uh, from terahertz up to uh, uh, far infrared. So the unit Saida and frequency space, it will be 30 wave numbers to uh, uh, 300 wave numbers, or in millivolts, it will be between four millivolts and uh, and uh, 40 millivolts. Okay, so what do they mean by superconducting response? Um, okay, so let me, yeah. Okay, let me guide you through this. Uh, okay, well, let, me, let me say several things first. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> first of all, in the high TC uh, cuprate, uh, it's known. Uh, uh, okay, maybe I should actually talk about it, what the response is. So, by superconducting lag response, what they mean is that the imaginary part of the conductivity uh, diverges like one of omega. Okay, and <clears throat> and this is what a superconducting does, right? And the reason you can think about this is that the real part of a superconductor has a delta function at the origin, right? It's a superconductor, so it's infinite conductivity uh, at the origin, infinite and narrow. If you do a Kramers chronic of that, then you get a rho over omega, right? So the imaginary part of the conductivity uh, behave right. So this is a standard <coughs> signature of a superconductor from optical means, right? <clears throat> and the claim is that they're seeing this, <clears throat> particularly in the imaginary part, uh, when they pump the system. Okay, so let me show you uh, uh, what that means. Um, so for that, maybe it's better for me to show you the C60 idea uh, data, which is more clearly shown. Okay, so this is the C60 case. The C60s are the buckyballs. And again, <clears throat> it's known that if you put uh, uh, potassium uh, there, they donate uh, uh, electrons to the buckyball. And um, they actually become an insulin, um, okay. It becomes metallic, okay. And this is where you can find a lot of uh, superconductors. Uh, typically the, the uh, transition temperature, maybe 10 degrees, 20 degrees, and can be up to uh, 35 Kelvin or, or so, okay. So it's not understood why TC is so high uh, in, this, in, this, in this kind of uh, system. Uh, it's actually one of the, one of the unsolved problems. Yeah, but uh, so in this particular case, the TC is 20 Kelvin. And okay, so here I can, now, here's what is shown above and below TC. So red is above TC and blue is below TC. So uh, forget about risk. Uh, so look at this, this is the real part of the conductivity, sigma one. This is the imaginary part of the conductivity, okay. So this is what is called a Druder term. Well, notice that the frequency scale is on a log scale. <clears throat> so it's a little strange, but it's only from four to 40 millivolts, okay? Narrow range and log scale. 
Now, so on a large scale, this is what a Judah peak looks like. Remember, I remind you, a Judah peak is a Lorentzian peak with a width which is give, which gives you the scaring rate. Okay, so zero you know, on a linear scale it would look like this. Okay, but log scale is kind of a little weird. And uh, and in the um, the imaginary part of the conductivity it looks like this. It doesn't do much. It kind of goes to a constant, but if you go below TC, it becomes a superconductor, and then you can see the gap, right? So this Judah peak is gone, and you see a superconducting gap, which in this case is about six millivolts. So this should be interpreted as twice the superconducting gap because optically you're driving uh, across the uh, superconducting gap. So this is two delta, which is absolutely reasonable, right? Because uh, two delta of uh, six millivolt is about 30 uh, Kelvin. And by BCS theory, it's about 3.2 2 delta is 3.5 TC. So that's exactly right. Okay. So this is a superconducting gap. And so not, no mystery. And then this is the uh, 1 over omega divergence uh, that I talked to you about. And the coefficient of this uh, divergence is so-called superfluid density. Okay? And this is the same number that appears in the Meissner effect in the uh, London equation. Okay, so this gives you a measure of the superfluid density, and uh, you can see the gap. Uh, so this behaves like uh, any old uh, uh, um, superconductor. Now the amazing thing is that now they go to 100 Kelvin, which is five times the uh, the transition temperature, and they drive the system with a pump with a uh, at the uh, infrared uh, energy, very intense pump. And then they do a pump probe experiment. They stop the pump, and then they measure the conductivity in the same way. And now you can see that before the pump, this is the equilibrium. At 100 Kelvin, it looks uh, pretty much the same. This is the Judah peak, and this is the kind of lazy imaginary part. But with the pump, then you, you can see that all the spectral weight is gone. It becomes uh, almost nothing. And then the... Uh, the thing that they focus on is that the imaginary part behave like one over omega. So this blue line is actually a theoretical curve with one over omega. Okay, so this is what they call superconducting like behavior, because if you just look at these, you would say that ah, I have a superconductor. Uh, the gap is not so clear what it is, but uh, you know, uh, you don't know whether it's here or here. Uh, but uh, this part is uh, is clearly what you would usually associate with a superconductor. Okay, so the idea is that, uh, uh, of course, in the super real superconductor, there's a delta function, the origin, right? All this weight goes into the delta function, and presumably something similar is happening. It's just that this thing is beyond the resolution of four millivolts. Okay, so that's the uh, story. Now, the story is the same for all these materials. Uh, so this is the organic that we are so familiar with now. It's a uh, so again, we just replace this um, uh, kind of molecule. This ET molecule is the same. Um, it's a 12 degree superconductor. But the superconductor, uh, they didn't show any um, measurement below TC. Uh, but they, if they go above TC, they go to, let's say 30 Kelvin, which is uh, about you know two and a half times the transition temperature. Uh, again, the red line is the equilibrium one. Uh, don't look at the re re reflectivity. So the conductivity, this is the Judah-like behavior. Judah-like behavior. Uh, and then uh, imaginary part not doing anything. When you pump it, uh, you see a gap. Well, it looks like a gap formation. And the imaginary part blows up like one of me. Okay. So somehow on the face of it, by pumping it, you turn this thing into a very high temperature superconductor with a huge gap. Look at this gap. This gap is a hundred, um, it's like, like, it's like 200 uh, wave numbers. Okay, that correspond to 100, 250 Kelvin. So even if this were two delta, uh, this gap is 10 times, uh, um, I think at least five, uh, two delta. Yeah, so 250 Kelvin. Uh, so delta is uh, 125 Kelvin. Um, 
Yeah, so this is much too much. Yeah, so I don't know, it's a factor of five or five big, too big compared with BCS theory. Okay, much too, much too big. Okay, so that's the data. Okay. Right. Now, I want to leave the cool place aside because the cool place is, is known to have strong pair fluctuation in the pseudo gap phase uh, up to very high temperature, 150 degrees. Um, it's uh, there's a lot of evidence from diamagnetism, from optics, and uh, from uh, plasma oscillations in char. Right? So maybe it's not that surprising that one sees supernatting like behavior when you drive it. Uh, in particular, the temperature where they see this effect never goes above the highest TC in the uh, Cooper family. Now, these two guys are different, okay? Uh, um, and in particular, uh, today I want to focus on the organic uh, material. Uh, the buckyball, it's three-dimensional, first of all, okay? Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about buckyball uh, next. Uh, right. Okay, so just uh, again, generally, the endotope cuprates are known to have pair fluctuation above TC, though I don't want to talk about them. Um, but what is common between these systems is that they are all near the mod transition. Okay. Now, the organics we already know, I already introduced you to them uh, right, previously, that uh, these systems are, um, are very close to the mod insulator uh, transition. Um, and it turns out that the buckyball is also. Uh, it's not as well known, but it's also very close to a mod transition. And the evidence is that you can start with something like cesium uh, copper, uh, uh, carbon 60, C60. Cesium, of course, is a much bigger um, atom than, than potassium, bigger iron. And it expands the ladders. So the volume per unit cell is small. And this is a mod insulator. Uh, it's an insulator with a um, uh, anti is an anti fermi insulator, okay, with very low uh, nail temperature, actually. Uh, if you put it under pressure, not much pressure, or if you substitute with a uh, smaller iron, uh, rubidium in this case, uh, you can make this into a, a metal, but in fact, a superconductor. In fact, people have constructed a universal uh, phase diagram of superconductivity. If you put everything in terms of volume for you to sell, of the buckyball, then all this uh, TC falls on a universal curve. And our friend potassium C60 is actually here, okay? So I think it's uh, reasonable to say that uh, potassium uh, free C60 is actually reasonably close to a mod transition, um, right? Okay, so this is a commonality between all these systems that have been uh, studied so far. Now I want to focus uh, today on the uh, on the only the organic because the uh, the buckyball is more complicated. It's three dimensional first of all, so our theory doesn't really apply. It's a first order transition, and in fact, there is some evidence for fluctuations of activity in the C sixteen. Um, so it may be soon in fluctuation, but I think for um, for the organics, it's a much harder argument to make that one is creating a superconductor. And so our, our path to this is that initially we were motivated by the uh, 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 superconductor, uh, ITC superconductors. And uh, Zehao and I did some work on, uh, on um, the pair fluctuation model um, with, with two charge two E bosons, the thing about uh, phase fluctuating pairs. But then it occurred to us that uh, the same theory actually can be applied to the organics because it's actually the same Lagrangian. So this is what I want to talk about uh, in the rest of my time. And this is something that we hope to uh, uh, post uh, maybe in the next week or so. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> right, we want to focus on, on the organics. Okay. Okay, so why, why, why is that? Well, let's go back to the basic uh, uh, Hamiltonian. Remember the Hamiltonian we have is a, <clears throat> Um, um, a spin on coupled to a gauge field and a relativistic boson, charge E boson coupled to a gauge field, right? Okay, so, so this will be our Hamiltonian, the Lagrangian. Uh, now I write this in terms of the usual Landau Ginsberg form. This is a Ginsberg Landau uh, form uh, with a charge gap, okay? 
Then, and now we introduce a driving force, a driving term. Okay. So this lambda is a optical pump initially, but in this case, the phenomenon happens when the pump is in resonance with uh, some special phonon mode, which are the stretching mode of the carbon bond and the, and the molecule. So it's like, I think it's quite natural to model this as a, that this thing is, um, is modulating the, maybe the charge gap, right? But so I'm modulating the, the carbon carbon bond, you're changing the electronic properties. So we, we just uh, make the simple uh, statement that the, that the effectivity of the drive it's not directly uh, absorbing the uh, light, but exciting a phonon, which in, print in, in turn uh, modulate the, uh, the effective gap. So this is our, our starting uh, uh, model. Okay, right. Now, in, in case of relativistic boson, we can write it in terms of a you know, particle like in a whole light term with the uh, dispersion like this. And so now we can, uh, write down the equation of motion for this and try to see what, what this driving thing does. So this driving thing is the new thing that uh, we have never looked at before, right? Remember up to now, we're looking at the gauge field problem of the boson and the, and the spin-on. So th that's a new thing. We, we just add this driving term, okay? So there's a well-known rotating uh, uh, phase approximation and, and the, the equation looks like this. So physically, what this is, is just the following. We, we know that we're driving with some frequency omega that is higher than the gap, right? So we it's actually just shift the, uh, we can effectively shift the, uh, the lower, the, the whole on state up to overlap with the, uh, with the double on state, right? So if you drive fermion, this is well known, right? This is the, uh, what is now called the floquet band, right? If you do this, then you open the gap uh, here, right? That's the Floquet band, right? So, so now I think it's quite popular, so people know what it is. Turns out the boson, that the effect is quite different. And that all has to do with this minus sign. You see, if you write down the same uh, equation of motion, for fermion, this will be a plus sign, in which case you have a, um, a, a, um, um, uh, uh, self-conjugate uh, term, okay? and the evolution is unitary. And we know that because this looks just like a superconductor, the, the Bogolubov uh, uh, transformation, and then we just have a U's and B's that are uh, like that. But for boson, if you carry the sign carefully, this is a minus sign. So this evolution of boson is not unitary, okay? And we also know that from the uh, original Bogolubov uh, application of the uh, interacting both gas, right? The U's and V's are cosh and cinch. They're not cosine and minus. Uh, so the constraint is that U square minus V square is one, not U square plus V square is one. The, uh, okay, so this has uh, uh, very important consequences because you, if you draw this thing, you can, it looks like the, the gap doesn't open here, but it's uh, open in the, in the K direction. Right. What do I mean by that? Because if you work out the eigenvalue, uh, it's uh, shifted by this eigenvalue becomes negative uh, in the region where uh, exactly in this so-called gap region. So gap, lambda is a driving force, right? So there's a region where they cross, uh, where the, so in this region, the eigenvalues are negative. What that means is that these modes grow exponentially right, when you drive it this way, okay? So that's the special feature, different, that's what's different between driving a fermion and driving a boson. In driving a fermion, you just get uh, um, these uh, bands and driving a boson, you can get these, uh, you can get its growth, right? So there's a growth within this uh, region. It, so in, in 2D, this is actually a ring uh, in momentum space, right? In K space, right? This is a K space. There's a ring in K space um, that is growing exponentially. And actually you can work out the, the state itself in the Heisenberg representation. And it looks like a kind of a particle hole condensate. Yeah, but that, um, not, not that important for our purpose. So now we have the state. And so we can calculate the linear response by the, uh, as, a, as a function of this uh, time evolution. 
and we can even include a dissipation rate. So the interesting thing we found is that we actually find this soon nothing like behavior because when this thing is growing exponentially, we find a growing superfluid density and the response function is purely imaginary and uh, it goes like one omega. And this row S is just the occupation of these uh, states, which are, as I explained, is growing in this ring, right, in K-space, right? So there's a large occupation in the ring of K-space, which can grow uh, in time. Because eventually it will saturate uh, because this superfluid density cannot go up forever. But uh, in this growing region, we find that this, uh, we find this um, uh, superconducting like behavior. On the other hand, uh, turns out that there's no Meissner effect. So we can calculate the Meissner effect also by linear response theory. And uh, <clears throat> this is a usual Meissner uh, London equation. <clears throat> Naively, you might think that since I have a superfluid density, I should have a Meissner effect. But no, we find zero response for the Meissner effect. Okay. Um, <clears throat> right. So mathematically, this is actually quite complicated to do because, uh, you know, Getting this is easy because this is the, for technically the diamagnetic term you get for free. But what is not easy to, is to show that the paramagnetic term actually cancels this exactly. And, uh, and that turns out to be the case. So this is not quite a superconductor. Uh, we call this a perfect conductor uh, uh, because that's what a perfect conductor does. A perfect conductor would be just like a fermion, Fermi C that has no scattering. It doesn't have a Meissner effect, but it has a, um, um, uh, um, superfluid, it, it responds exactly like this. There's a delta function in uh, respect. So it has to do with the uh, limit. This is a, a free, finite frequency, uh, zero Q limit. Right, so Q goes to zero first. In the optical response, Q equals zero and omega is finite. In the Meissner response, uh, omega is zero and then Q is finite to get a magnetic field. So it turns out that you can make a physical picture to explain this. Uh, because we have growing bosons, the, the boson may be scattered out with dissipation, scattered out of the growth region, but they keep, they are keeping replenished by the pump. So the current actually does not decay. Uh, the, the, it doesn't grow as fast as a pump because of the, of the scattering, but it's still, uh, there's, there's still a perfect, um, uh, 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 there's a, it's still like an infinite uh, current in the presence of the electric field. However, the Meissner effect is uh, more tricky. So we can consider a, um, a, um, a, um, a ring geometry, a uh, cylinder geometry, a Corbino geometry, and put a flux through the middle to simulate the uh, um, magnetic field and the gauge field. Now, and of course, uh, so in, in the usual Bose condensation case, we start out with all the bosons are in one state at zero. When you put a gauge field like this, it shifts by A, right? So the energy goes like A squared, right? And the current is the derivative of the energy gain, uh, uh, first derivative with respect to A, and then that's how you get the uh, London current, right? So this is why you get the uh, London equation. Now, you can ask yourself, why doesn't this work in a Fermi C? If I have a conventional electron, I have a Fermi uh, C in a in a electro in a gauge field. Uh, then again, the momentum shifts by k to k plus a. So here I draw the grid points. I consider a finite system. I draw a grid point. The grid size is two pi over l, right? So. In, in a gauge field, all the grid points would move to the right. So instead of moving a grid point, I just draw a circle to show that the, uh, the, the circle has moved, okay? So if the, if the occupation does not change, in other words, you do this adiabatically and move the electrons with the gauge field, then of course your energy goes up, right? Because all your energy uh, has, has shifted and then you get a Meissner effect. But what happens in the, so we see is that you can get a reoccupation. So all these states that are, has gone up in energy, uh, you will find a space down here where they can, can move, okay? And in two dimension, you can do that because in the thermodynamic limit, 
the number of grid points inside this crescent is infinite. So you can always find enough space to move it. So to make a long story short, in the super in the metal, uh, the um, the um, the ground state energy does not change uh, with A. Now in the superconductor, you cannot do this because there's a gap and you cannot make this redistribution. Now our problem is we have in our current problem is actually more like the free Fermi C because we have a region in K space where we have maximum growth of the occupation. And so if you follow this argument through, then you see that there's actually no energy change. And then we have a minus there. We have no minus effect. Okay, so again, to summarize, the main difference between driving fermion and boson is that if you drive fermion, this is actually a well-known uh, situation. The fermion, each state has maximum occupation of one. And drive, we just create hot carriers. This kind will scatter and then dribble down and you just heat up the system. With bosons, you have a ring where you can increase the occupation uh, density uh, and get into this funny state. Okay, right. So now we can put the story together. We have now considered what happens to the boson when we drive it. Then of course, we want the physical response, which is the total electron. And we've known that we can just use the Yofi-Larkin rule. Now the fermion conductivity is a spin on conductivity that is well known. That is just the Druder conductivity with the density of fermions. Uh, and then uh, there's some kind of scattering rate. Now the boson conductivity uh, has two parts. There's the, the parts that we identified. With the drive, we have a finite, uh, what looks like a, a superfluid density, but really not quite. There's another piece, which we call the quasi-static piece, which is the background term, which is always there. So, you know, even without a drive, the boson has a conductivity across the mod gap. Now, this thing now is not a superconducting gap, but an insulating gap. It's a mod gap. Right? So the, this, this thing looks, looks like this. When you put everything together, uh, you will get this kind of picture. So this is the real part of the conductivity. This is the major part of the conductivity. Without drive, you get uh, the, the mod insulator, which has a mod gap uh, here. And then there will be an increase in conductivity above here. This is a log scale again, right? With the pump, uh, theory says that there is a omega, one over omega term in the imaginary part. And the real part actually uh, uh, develop a Judah behavior because uh, by Kramer's chronic, there has to be some peak here. This peak here is actually reflect the width of this is the Jude, is a, is a scaring rate of the, of the spin on, but reduced by the ratio of the boson and the fermion density. Okay. So this is actually, uh, this picture is very nice because in principle, this gives us access to the scattering rate of the spin-on uh, if you can measure uh, at low frequency, at least by microwave to, to, to see this uh, do the peak. Okay. Now, so uh, finally, I can try to make contact with the experiment, which is not done on the mod insulator, but was done in the superconductor, right? So, so this is the data. Yeah, we saw before. So the story we make is that in a superconductor, uh, this we have the Landau Ginsburg theory. This term is negative because we have both condensation. Now, if we drive it, what I've shown before is that we build up both on occupation. So we're building up this quadric term. When we increase the quadric term, <clears throat> that has the effect of increasing the quadratic term as well, right? By, by some mean field theory. So a drive can also move the system from a insulator into a, from metal to an insulator, right? Because I changed the sign of this. Initially it's negative and now it's positive, right? So our story is that with strong pumping, we build up, build up the boson occupation and then we lead to a metal insulator transition. And so we would say that this gap here is, uh, is actually, in our story, is actually a mod gap, it's an insulating gap. And this is why it's so large. This gap uh, is enormous on, on the superconducting uh, scale, right? Um, and so this is some, uh, using our calculation, uh, we can get curves that uh, 
look very similar to what is there in the, in the experiment, of course, with some adjustment of parameter. Uh, to support this point of view, I want to bring your attention to the fact that this metal is actually highly anomalous because uh, the coherence scale of this metal is extremely small. So if you look at the resistivity of this, um, of this superconductor, you start out with high temperature, resistivity is extremely high at, at, at 50 Kelvin. At 50 Kelvin, it plunges and becomes what we call coherent. Uh, metal, right? This is where the Fermi liquid is. And then at 10 Kelvin, it becomes a superconductor. Okay. And you can see this in the Judah uh, equilibrium Judah response. Okay. The, the Judah peak is very broad and then narrow, but uh, uh, already at 50 Kelvin, the DC conductivity is very small, but it doesn't look Judah at all. It is actually rising as a function of frequency. So this metal is extremely incoherent already at 50 Kelvin. So this is unlike any conventional Fermi liquid at all. So we think this is a sign that this is very close to the mod transition. And on this scale, this, this superconductor gap is actually in this incoherent range. It's right here where the system is totally coherent. So this is our story that uh, maybe in, at this particular case, uh, the gap is uh, appearing is actually not a pairing gap, but a mod gap. So this is a very speculative and uh, I would say kind of outrageous uh, statement. Uh, but I think it will still be interesting uh, to test this directly uh, by pumping. Uh, why not just pump a spin liquid, right? So I, I think it will be interesting. It will be simpler from our point of view to directly pump uh, the spin liquid candidates and particularly, this the MIT is a very good candidate because it's uh, uh, it shows a clear optical gap of six hundred uh, wave numbers, uh, which is still smaller than the pump uh, phonon frequency. So the idea is to see do we do we see a similar one over omega behavior, superconducting like behavior, if we pump this uh, system? Okay, so that would be a, uh, a prediction that can it can be uh, falsifiable. Um, yeah, so other possible application to this uh, uh, calculation is that, you know, we can also, this applies actually to a bosonic mod gap, um, with um, bosonic mod insulator, uh, which can be created in co-atom with periodic uh, optical lattices, right? So we can pump them and see what happens. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so this last part is a little bit uh, um, 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 bold, I would say. But uh, I would think without this uh, uh, experiment, which is really uh, difficult to explain, I think we would not have been bold enough to propose this. But uh, so we're throwing this out. Uh, hopefully, it would stimulate more ideas and, and experiments. So I think this is all I have uh, uh, today. OK, a little bit oh, past my time. But uh, yeah, I would uh, welcome any questions. All right, thank you. Wonderful talk. So our first question is, is thermal conductivity easy to measure in twisted TMD MARE materials? I'm not an experimentalist, but I, don't, I think it will be very difficult because you have only one layer. <laughs> yeah, it sounds hard. It sounds very hard. Uh, I think uh, people have done it in, um, in the context of the quantum hall, right? They can measure in one, in one layer, they can measure thermal conductivity. Uh, but they're using all kinds of tricks. So I don't know whether any of these tricks is possible. But it certainly it will be a challenge for the experimenters. Okay, our second question is, in most of the spin liquid, in most spin liquids, a transverse thermal conductivity is seen. Can you discuss more about this, particularly in TMDCs? I'm sorry, trans, can, can you repeat? A, a transverse thermal conductivity or thermal hall is seen. Can you discuss more about this particularly in TMDCs. In TM. TMDCs, oh, this, yeah. No, there's, uh, there's no thermal Hall effect at all, right? And we just, yeah, there's, even thermal conductivity cannot be measured. So thermal Hall is even harder. Yeah, so there, there's certainly no data. Um, and I think it's unlikely there will be data yeah, in the, in the in TMDCs, yeah. 
Yeah, so we have to adapt and try to find some other smoking gun experiments. Yeah, so that's something that I'm very much interested in working on right now. And, uh, and uh, I think that, that, that will be very good problems. Our next question is, in Moire experiments, if spin-on Fermi C is indeed happening at the insulating side, will there be oscillation signatures when applying a magnetic field? If yeah, so, very good question. Is yeah. this, can this be, has yeah, this been seen so, experiments? Yeah, so that's actually exactly what we are working on now. So I'm working with a postdoc and I'm trying to look for uh, oscillation. So in principle, there could be oscillations of the mod gap, right? Um, and um, in principle, you know, if if motion is just right, then you could see os quantum oscillations in the magnetization, which actually can be measured in the in the as I as I uh, said in the uh, and and in the, by the Cornell group because there they have a trick. Yeah. So so first of all, <laughs> just measuring magnetization on a single layer is extremely challenging, right? Um, because it, you know, you don't have any sample. And so I think there are ideas of using uh, uh, this, uh, what do you call this? Uh, um, um, NP centers, uh, you can probe, and that's some, one of some ideas. Uh, and then, but uh, in, in this particular case, they can take advantage of this, op they can measure it optically uh, because the, I think they, they, there's a one transition that, that is chiral, that depends on the, on the chirality. So by applying magnetic field, they can enhance the, uh, uh, absorption. Uh, so, so they actually managed to measure the, uh, the uh, magnetization, which is uh, an amazing feat in itself. So, so in principle, they can look for fundamental for oscillations in that. Yeah, yeah. But there are complications. I already talked to uh, um, 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 uh, Hey uh, uh, Mark. Uh, the problem is that uh, the G factor is very small, so the the spins get aligned with a with a very you know you cannot apply a few more than a few Tesla, and the spins get aligned. Uh, there's very uh, very large G factor uh, in this direction. Apparently. <clears throat> so again, uh, nature may not be too kind to us there. Okay, the next question is: Can we conclude that the interaction is mediated by phonons according to the decay rate presented in the data? Can we extract more information about the interaction by looking on the time delay dependence? This is um, not sure in what context. Uh, which the, the scaring rate for what for for the spin-ons? Uh, uh, I'm not quite I'm sure. Not sure. Can you can you repeat that? Maybe you can ask the question. Sure, I'll, I'll just repeat the question one more time. Uh, maybe you can, you can unmute, unmute him. I, I'll ask him to ask the question. Maybe. Is I will Is he still there? All right. Uh, I'll unmute you, and then you can ask your question. No. Okay, no, I, I didn't okay. quite follow. Yeah, uh, maybe he's thinking about this um, linear plot of thermal conductivity. Um, but that's the, the the linear part is all phonons, and and so yeah, so you only get this. Um, yeah, okay, maybe maybe he's referring to the fact that I, I claim that the mean free part is very long for the for the spin on from the thermal conductivity measurement. Yeah, so actually, yeah, we don't know what what that is. Uh, I mean, you might say that the spin-on is actually not scattered very much because it's charge neutral, right? So it's not it's not sensitive to directly to to charge defects, right? So maybe that's why um, it does couple the phonon. Uh, we show that uh, in the paper. The spin-on actually does couple to uh, to transverse uh, to um, to phonon in the same way that electron does by a deformation coupling potential. So the paper where we discussed this transverse, uh, this jump in the transverse thermal, um, uh, this, this uh, ultrasound attenuation, we discussed the coupling of the spin on to, to phonons. Yeah, so, so we did, um, let's there, work on that problem. So if he's interested, he can, he can look up that Yizhou paper that I, 
Okay, and then the last question for oh no, this is not the last question. Um, what is the pulse duration? Floquet's theorem is usually a good description using multi-cycle laser pulses. Uh, yeah, so I'm not using a Floquet description here, right? So, so the idea here is that the pulse is actually very short. The pulse is um, it ranges from uh, I think tens of femtoseconds up to they can make it long longer now, um, but typically they are like ten to hundred femtoseconds. Okay, but the story is that actually the pulse, uh, the the pulse actually excite the phonons, and the phonons would keep vibrating. So the phonon lifetime is actually long; it can be a lot of picoseconds. Okay, so our picture is that the drive is actually, it, it, even after they turn off the optical pulse, the phonons is continue to 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 drive the system for about a picosecond. Okay. And the response they see is on the picosecond delay time scale, the, the one that I showed you. So the, the pulse delay is a picosecond. And after pic, after five picoseconds, the effect is gone. Okay. Right. So, so that that may suit the full case scale because picosecond is actually a very long time compared with the frequency of the drive. So there are many, many cycles. So again, the original optical pulse is only a few cycles, but the phonons have many, many cycles. I, I didn't make that clear uh, during the talk. Yeah. So this drive is kind of continuous, and that's why you can build up the uh, you can build up this occupation. Okay. Next question is: Has thermal hall been observed in one TTAS two? No. <laughs> yeah, again, it's one layer. So no chance. How about bulk TAS2? Uh, bulk TAS2 is not a good candidate. It's a, um, it's a metal. So a place to do it would be um, tenderized sulfide. Oh, uh, no, sorry. I, I was saying TAS2. Sorry, my mic probably wasn't. Yeah, TAS2. Yeah, yeah. Bulk TAS2 would be, would be good. Yeah. So I don't know if there's uh, data on that. Uh, um, I think um, Joe Tchaikovsky at MIT may have tried actually, but um, I don't think they've seen anything uh, yet. Yeah, yeah. So that's the system where the uh, yeah Matsuda claims to see thermal conductivity. So I think I think thermal hall should be doable. Yeah. But it's, yeah, up to now, the only one in the world that sees thermal conductivity is Matsuda's group. So. so the first thing is to for people to reproduce it, yeah. presumably with good enough samples, and then. Uh, yeah. Okay, if you have extra time, maybe I could ask some of the leftover questions from your sure. first, from okay. the first half. Okay, so the first question is does integrating out high energy fermions also modify the constraint when you were doing the uh, yeah that's a that's a fair question and uh, we we kind of um, throw all these things out under the rug you know because we, I think basically the idea is just that you know as long as you can argue that this uh, coupling is not infinite you can start you know doing something yeah so it, it's very hand waving I, I agree yeah so I think the constraint, so the whole idea of emergence is that, you know, we start out with something that is perfectly constrained on a lattice scale, right? That's the high energy physics. And the emergence is that that constraint is violated on the lattice scale. We don't need to keep that constraint anymore. And, and that's because the particles that we're describing it are different. They're not the original uh, particle anymore. They are some emergent particles that lives only in some in some low energy sense. Right? So so that's that's the, that's the justification. Yeah. Okay. And the next question is: Since the notion of high energy slash short wavelength fermions isn't gauge invariant, does this lead to issues? Yeah, I said 
try, try to describe the gauge invariance. Is not it's not a real yeah. picture because we we all as long as you always remember to keep the gauge field, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because otherwise you're in trouble in our world too. <coughs> right? <coughs> electrons are not real. <coughs> the electron Green's function is not gauge invariant. So, but we we write them. You know, we write papers with electron Green's function all the time. <laughs> Okay, the next question is, when discussing the spin-on Fermi surface to Fermi surface transition, on the boson condensation side, will bosons have a gapless Goldstone mode, and will such gapless modes have any observable effects? Um, yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think that is the case, yeah. The... Uh, um, yeah, that <clears throat> that the phase of the boson just became the phase of the electron, right? And um, um, I think there's no, I think there's no separate degrees of freedom as far as I know. Okay. Then, has a purely structural origin of the transition of the compound on the last slide been ruled out? I guess it's one of those. Organic compounds? Oh, yeah, the organic. <clears throat> uh, no. Um, uh, in fact, there are people who think that this could be a uh, so called valence bond solid, that there's some, at least short range order, short range ordering. Okay. So that's uh, certainly one possible scenario. But so far, there's no, I think people have done x ray on this and they, there's no, but not seeing anything doesn't mean that it's not there. Um, so that's very uh, quite wide open there. Uh, people that think that this ground state is actually a so-called valence bond solid, um, um, right? And then could you so elaborate on? With, oh, yeah, sorry. let me just say that the problem with all this is that uh, it's very hard to reconcile uh, something that has a really spin uh, spin gap with the with the specific heat measurement, which shows a very robust uh, uh, C over T term, right? And this, this C over T term is quite large. Um, so as I said, it corresponds to a Fermi surface with a, with a bandwidth, which is you know, a few hundred Kelvin. So it, it, uh, it's a big, you know, it's, it's, it's 20 millivolt, millijoules per second. So it's 10 times copper right, per, per mole. Uh, and uh, it's almost heavy fermion scale. It, it's not a small effect, and it's independent of magnetic field. They put eight Tesla on, and it doesn't change, right? Um, so, if you if you think of a VBS state, which which is has a gap, then you have to come up with an explanation of uh, of some low lying, yeah, thing to carry entropy, but doesn't carry any spin. Yeah. So that's a challenge at the moment. Uh, how to reconcile this? So that, that's why this uh, low, low temperature state is uh, quite mysterious. Okay, and then the next question is, could you elaborate on how the Boltzmann approach still works without quasi-particles? Yeah, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, uh, in a word, you know, in the original formulation, you know, with quasi-particle, you rely on the fact that uh, the quasi-particles are uh, well-defined in frequency space, right? So they're narrower than the than the uh, than than the energy. Okay. So what Prangi and kind of showed is that uh, you don't need that. All you need to do is to show that they are well-defined in momentum space. So this is like in experiment. You know, if you do RPS, there's something called MDC and EDC, right? EDC is that you fix it, make a scan. That, as a function of energy at a fixed momentum. And you see something extremely broad, right? And you say, oh, I have no Fermi surface, I'm nothing, right? But if you make so-called MDC scan, so you, you scan at a fixed energy, near the Fermi energy, but as a function of K, and you see very sharp peaks, okay? And this, this is possible because you can have something that's very sharp in momentum space, and very narrow in energy space. And this is exactly what happens in these systems because the self-energy 
is independent of momentum, but the function of omega. So what mathematically in this system is self, the self energy goes like omega to the two third power, right? So the self energy has a both a real and imaginary part. They both like omega to the power, which is bigger than linear omega. Right? But it is independent of uh, frequency. Okay, so if you take a fixed frequency cut, when omega is small enough, then the width is actually very small, and it's independent, and it, it, it will be very sharp in k. Okay, so that's just what they they used um, in instead of thinking in energy space, they think in momentum space. So it is, it's a really brilliant piece of work by these very clever people from a long time ago. And then we, we can benefit from it just by reading it. But somehow this idea has not propagated very much. And, you know, people keep talking about non Fermi liquid being you know, very difficult and so on and so on. But actually, the, the transfer property can be very, uh, very simple. Now, in practice, there are some issues of electrical conductivity because uh, it has to do with, uh, you need to have an umklap term because these, this scattering is, uh, you know, forward scattering and doesn't relax momentum. So for electrical transport, you need to um, worry about umklaps. And I, I recently wrote a paper on that, um, it's on archive. But for thermal conductivity, actually, you don't need to worry about that. It's got thermal conductivity, you can relax energy without umklap. And then, uh, so, so you, you can behave just like a Fermi liquid. Okay. And the next question is, could you please explain how, again, how the Lagrangian containing both fermions and bosons coupled to a gauge field was proposed? Oh, um, in the original paper with Somsig, we actually derived it. We made an attempt to derive it by considering fluctuation around the mean field. Yeah. So there's actually a derivation. It's actually fairly complicated. Yeah. But um, but after that, uh, people say, oh, yeah, this is obvious <laughs> from a physical point of view because you have spin-ons and then you, you need you need to have the uh, charge on you, you the, for the for the charge part you need you need the particle and the antiparticle right because you can make double on and and hold on so that's why you need a relativistic boson and uh, so 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 that's the physical reason but uh, mathematically you need it, you need to go through a derivation and then. In two plus one dimensions, the coupling constant E squared has units of one over length. So E squared should go to infinity at long wavelengths. So Maxwell's term should get smaller, but integrating out high energy fermions generates a Maxwell term. So how can both of these be true? Hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I cannot answer that. It's not too technical for me right now. I cannot give an adequate answer. Yeah, off the top of my head. I don't want to say anything stupid. <laughs> Let me pass on that. Okay, no problem. Then, how does the UN gauge theory alter the Pomeranchuk instability condition of the Fermi surface that the said gauge is coupled to? Oh, the Parmanchuk is the is the uh, is a breathing distortion. Um, again, I don't know whether that has been looked at. Um, the Parmanchuk, uh, you know, actually, it, the in interesting thing is that the Parmanchuk instability has the same soft mode. The soft mode of the Parmanchuk instability has the same uh, structure as the gauge field. Uh, you know, at criticality, so that's where they share a lot of commonality. You know, the critical. The quantum critical point of, of the parameter transitivity uh, maps onto the gauge problem. Yeah, maybe that's what uh, uh, then this uh, this person has in mind. Yeah, but as far as how how they are coupled, if they're both there, I don't know. I don't know if that, that has been looked at. Yeah, usually people just look at one problem at a time. I don't think people have looked at the parameter instability of a spin-on. Yeah, people look at parameter instability of uh, actually electron. Right. which doesn't have the gauge field. So, so this is a higher level complication. Yeah, I don't think that problem has been looked at. Okay, we just have two more questions. Thanks for staying so late. No, yeah, no, no problem. 
So the next question is, is it possible for a spin liquid to emerge in an itinerant phase of electrons with finite magnetic interaction? In a metal? I guess. Yeah, but then then it's a metal, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then then the spin on, yeah, there's no reason for the spin on to to exist. Yeah. It's, a, it's perfectly happy as a metal. There's no reason for it to share this charge. Okay, and then is it possible for a spin liquid to exist in a quasi-periodic crystal? Hmm. This is an interesting question. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, that, that's a that's a thesis. <laughs> oh, and I guess a follow-up to that one is is there anything or are there other lattices besides the Kagomi lattice or I suppose the triangular lattice that might host a quantum spin liquid state that haven't been explored or realized? Um right. Yeah, well, of course, you know, there, there are these twisted lattices now, this uh, Moray lattice was that, uh, you know, that's uh, fruitful. And, you know, there's this famous uh, honeycomb Kataev, which is a different story entirely. Um, but other than, other than that, I, I'm not aware. Oh, you know, there, are, there is this three-dimensional um, uh, Kakome that I mentioned. Uh, uh, these are three-dimensional um, 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 triangles. Uh, corner sharing triangles. Uh, Takagi has uh, studied those uh, about 10 years ago. There were a number of papers and there's no ordering too. Yeah. So those, those could be, could well be spin liquid, but just has not been much follow up on that. Uh, I don't know why actually, uh, but they are like, yeah, they're three dimensional version of Kagome, like, but they're they corner sharing uh, triangles. All right. Thank you so much for your talks today. Okay. I definitely learned a lot. Okay, very good. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. So thank you.